Word. Cool. Okay. Well, I think I'm ready to let the six people that are in now, and I think we're all co-hosts, so we can kind of let people in as they come. We'll see everybody that comes. All right. Hello, 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 everybody. Hi. Welcome. Happy Tuesday. Hope everyone's having a great day. We're still going to wait a few minutes as everybody joins us. We're starting right at the top at three. So we'll just give people another minute or two. Um, I know I'm really looking forward to this. I personally and, and several of the rest of us too just got back from NFT NYC. So I've been talking a lot about NF NFTs and everything. Um, I, yep, I know that we do have, um, we wanna be able to be collaborative and do questions later. So I did leave people with the ability to unmute themselves, but please do mute yourself for now um, as we get started. And like I said, we'll have moments for questions later. Um, and yeah, all right. So um, I think we'll kick things off. Um, we are recording, by the way, everybody. Um, so please message me if you do have a question and then you end up not wanting to have that be in the recording. I can always edit it out. Um, and on that note, we'll get started for the day. So welcome to how can your business leverage NFTs? We're going to get started with introducing ourselves and talking about what NFTs are and give some kind of definitions. And then we'll go into specific use cases. We'll have periods throughout the presentation as well as at the end for questions. So please feel free to Drop those in the chat if you want, but just know that we will have a time to come back to them. Um, so on that note, yeah, I'll, I'll introduce myself and then pass it off to our other awesome speakers. So I'm, I'm Benny. Um, I'm the co-founder of Birdwell Solutions, where we do strategy and development for NFT projects and other Web3 projects. So we work with companies to help figure out what they want to do technologically and also in all other aspects, and then help them launch and help them build cool technology. Um, so I'll pass over to Ryan Kirkley, CEO of Krypton Labs. Want to take, take us away? Yes. So I'm Ryan number one. We also have another Ryan here, not to confuse you guys at all, but uh, my background is uh, largely in marketing, uh, came from a marketing agency in politics, Worked with a lot of big brands, private equity, doing digital evaluation, scaling e-commerce. Entered the NFT space about two years ago and kind of scaled up from there. Uh, today, we run Krypton Labs, Krypton Media, Krypton Entertainment, kind of full service um, from development to media to even fundraising, PR, and acce acceleration of any projects people are on. Uh, my primary focus and where I spend most of my time is either on, on capital raising for Web3 or uh, talking about celebrity activations and NFTs in the metaverse. Cool, and I'm Ryan too. <laughs> um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Movers. Movers is a creative agency that helps brands build their communities. Uh, the last couple of years, we've been focused more in like the entertainment and event sphere. And then recently, the last eight months, we kind of dived into Web3, uh, utilizing NFT technology and blockchain technology to help uh, basically connect brands to their communities better and in a new creative way. So happy to be here. Awesome. awesome. And on that note, go ahead, Ryan Kirkley, and we'll take us away. So su super excited to start and not knowing everyone's background, we'll go with a really quick, maybe five to 10 minute, uh, just recap of what are NFTs, how does this all operate? And then we'll get into more of the business applications. Uh, so NFT is obviously the buzzword of really the last two, two years or so. Everyone seems to be talking about it. Everyone wants to be a part of it. But what is it? And so for us, it's it's basically breaking down to it's, it's a unit of data stored on the blockchain that represents a unique item, whether it's artwork, whether it's a physical item, whether it's a ticket or a digital asset. It's pretty much that simple. Now, Benny or Ryan, do you guys have any other definitions or ways you like to explain that's maybe a little bit simpler? I like to think of it as an item on the blockchain. So you can take anything that you want, that's where like the monkey images that we see here are one example. And you can leverage the benefits of blockchain by representing that item on the blockchain. I agree. I think the most important thing is that 
it, it's that authentication, that proof of uh, ownership that these things can hold and what you could do with that is what makes this so powerful. Yeah, and I, I think to all of those points, I think one of the really powerful parts of this is that it's it's what what blockchain is it on, right? Everyone talks about all these things. Bitcoin's obviously the biggest thing people are known. But that's honestly not where most NFTs are run. Uh, so we use a lot of stuff on Ethereum, Solana. Um, there's plenty of other ones that are also have specific use cases and applications. It really just depends on what you are looking to do and, and what's the best solution for you. Um, getting into it kind of go going forward, uh, the NFT represents a digital asset inside of a digital wallet. This can be used in many aspects from we have in-app wallets where you may never even know that you actually own an NFT because the wallet is completely storing all information inside the inside of the application or you could have something you know a physical wallet cold wallet uh metamask all sorts of things that people are able to use here um there's very little restrictions around what this can be and so that's the cool part is that this is really as, as strong as your imagination i mean we have people selling highlights of nba games we have music artists selling cl clips of pieces we got ticketing popping up uh, all the way over to Shopify being one of the biggest proponents of NFTs now through token gated commerce and, you know, unique experiences from a brand level. Um, any favorite use cases, guys, or things that you've seen that are really cool from brands? I see a lot going on, but what excites me is projects that use NFTs in other industries other than arts and entertainment. And one that I've seen um, as an example is lofty.ai it's not quite your traditional understanding of an nft but they allow people to rent real estate and actually to purchase real estate through their platform so i'm excited about seeing items that are in other industries get put onto blockchain absolutely and now this is where i think uh benny may be our expert in the space on this but it's uh all, all NFTs are built through a smart contract. Now, essentially what that means, it's, it's programs stored on the blockchain with predetermined conditions. Why that's important and why that's so different and why there's so much hype behind this. It means it can't be, it can't be scammed, it can't be duplicated, it can't be altered. So you as a brand, when you build a smart contract, it puts, you, it puts the smart contract in control. So for a consumer perspective, there's a lot more trust because innately you've created this contract that is set in stone as much as it can be in the digital world. Um, now, I'll definitely let Benny talk a bit here because, I mean, he's my go-to expert on all things smart contracts. So I think he's probably the best one to go in a little bit more detail. Absolutely. Uh, so I think we're all familiar with contracts, right? And how they function, just regular paper contracts, right? You have two participants that are agreeing to something and allowing the terms of what they put on paper to be what binds them. Smart contracts take that same basic problem of how do two people kind of agree to something and come together, but they put it on blockchain, which makes it secure as well as automatic. So for example, um, say that somebody decided to hire me for my development services and said, hey, if you launch this app to the app store, that will be the thing that makes me do my final payment to you. I will send a payment if you launch this to the app store. With a traditional contract, that's exactly what we'd write down. We'd write it down on paper and we'd, we'd sign the contract. And when that day came, I would send an invoice. With a smart contract, we're able to take that same agreement and define it, and that's a little complicated, but essentially to say, hey, if we notice on the app store that Benny pushes the app, we can automatically do the payment. So while on a surface level, it's very similar to a contract, it actually enables us to go much further than just contracts. Because all of a sudden we can write things in that handle assets like NFTs and allow people to send money across borders and allow people to do a lot more things than, um, than simply agree on development services. But it's a good example for how something can be 
a simple contract, but then you can make it automatic by putting it into a smart contract. I also think it's really cool. And there's a lot of conversations happening in the space around the legality of this, particularly high ticket items, high service items, uh, anything that is functioning in large things of funds. This will at some point revolutionize how you purchase a home. This will revolutionize how you purchase a car, how you interact with the government, et cetera. Um, there's already a ton of companies in the space doing this, but I think it's really important to think of this as like a, a automatic legal contract. Um, for a lot of purposes. And going the wrong way there. Um, to jump in here, so kind of the use cases that we're going to cover here and really go into detail on um, crypto payments for high price items, obviously, any e commerce store, a person who's offering real high ticket items. Uh, the second will be unique items purchased with NFTs. And when I say unique, I mean one of ones here. Uh, this is really big in the fashion space, car space, boat space, et cetera. Um, next is token gating, which may be my personal favorite um, coming from the e-commerce world. And then we'll dive into subscriptions, membership and loyalty programs where the other Ryan will really be diving in. And, and then in detail, kind of that loyalty program side of things as well. Um, there's a ton of other use cases. Uh, we try to keep this very specific to how a typical, you know, mid-sized business today could really utilize NFTs, but we could be talking for hours about every, everything else that there is. Um, jumping in. So high ticket, high ticket items here and what they kind of look, what, what we kind of look for when we, when we start talking to people about this is can I pay you in crypto? Now, if, if I have to convince anyone that crypto payments are probably useful, my go-to is, is right away, I look to, I look to the biggest store in the e-commerce world, Shopify. They accept crypto. I look to Apple Pay. It is now being used to buy and purchase crypto. I, I look to every major bank under the sun. They now have a crypto arm, a crypto lending wing. I look to the fact that we're talking about FTX, one of the largest crypto exchanges, buying Robinhood. The, the world has switched, right? It's already switched where now crypto is one of the fastest growing asset classes. It has the most monetary hype and in income. And it presents unique opportunities to offer these transactions in the currency. Now, why is that a benefit to you? One, it removes most of the transaction fees that you typically would have from credit cards. So typically speaking, if you're taking a 3 to 4% cut, or even if you have a great deal and it's 1.5%, you're losing a major market share and a major profit opportunity just in transaction cost alone. Then secondarily, I don't know about you, but when I used to run a clothing co company's marketing and e-commerce, we had a ton of people dispute credit cards transactions, despite the fact that the addresses would match. And we would oftentimes have up to a million dollars sitting in credit card disputes at a time as we're sitting there negotiating with them on that. And so it's a huge opportunity to get this instant verifiable transaction that happens in real time and gets it done right away. The other side of it, and I, I mean, I, you know, it's, I don't like to ride on hype, but there is a bit of a hype. And particularly in smaller markets and things like that, you can really own the fact that you're the first in the space to do so. It gives you some free PR, gets some local interest, gives you a nice little story to post about on LinkedIn and, and even your blog or, you know, podcast. Um, Benny or Ryan, anything to add kind of on the high ticket item side? Yeah, I know. Um, for me, I think it is helpful to think that it's not for everybody to pay in crypto. However, if you've got one customer asking you for it now, and then more customers, it's likely to assume that that trend will increase. I know that was what happened with us, is we had customers that asked for it and then continued to ask. And we eventually took the time to say, hey, if people are asking for it now, there'll probably be more customers that would prefer to find a vendor that pays this way in the future. Um, yeah, I, and, and kind of like what you said, Ryan, like it's riding that kind of wave. I, I know a bunch of local businesses near me are starting to like accept crypto as a form of payment. And for them, it's really just a marketing tool to say, hey, we're cool. We're new. We're, we're up to date. So I think even like you said, for a local business to kind of jump on it, there is a buzz to it. And it does kind of help kind of spread awareness. They're doing something different than maybe their competitor. Yeah, and I think, I think a cool thing to kind of say is like, this used to be really daunting. I know about three years ago, a company came to me um, and wanted to accept crypto. And quite honestly, I, after talking with them, just 
point blank advised them not to. And the reason was that they didn't have an IT person. They didn't have any sort of education tools. And the marketplace was confusing. I mean, if I wanted to go buy Ethereum as a first-time user, it could take me 72 to 96 hours. And there was only maybe 10,000 of us actually purchasing in it in this space. Nowadays, though, there's so many programs from handling the taxes to handling the actual transactions to uh, even where you can purchase with Apple Pay, buying the crypto in real time, do the transaction in crypto and walk away. And so it gives you the ability to really make this, this cookie cutter solution that is kind of unlike where the space was a few years ago. Now there's a lot of opportunity to make this simple and easy. Perfect. Jumping into the next one, unique items as NFTs. Um, so I'll, I'll start here right now and talk, talk with, you know, this is where you have the opportunity to really go into any type of item that you can sell and offer it, offer it as an NFT first. Now, there's a few reasons for that. First of all, it's the security of the blockchain. The second, second side of this is what, is what is an NFT at the end of the day? Well, according to the IRS, it's a collectible. Now, depending on the price point of the item you're selling, that can be a pretty big, big deal because a collectible is taxed differently. It can be used as a write-off. It has all sorts of implications that I encourage you and others to educate yourselves on. Right now, I don't want to go into the financial advice of it, but there's a whole host of, of great opportunities there. The second side is that it allows you to capture a unique customer audience of the NFT customer. And so right now, for example, my company based here in Miami, we're working with some yacht brokers. Why? Because it's a unique way to purchase something that gets after the you know, a lot of crypto millionaires and high net worth individuals who are almost exclusively looking to spend and purchase in crypto. And so it gives us this, this secondary. The third is the resellability. It's a lot easier to resell an NFT and do the shipping and things like that there than it is to necessarily sell a hard item going through eBay or something like that. And so it makes this where there's this like static item there. Now, the cool part to you as a business, say you're an art vendor and you're selling a million dollar piece of art. Well, you can make this NFT function as that, that artwork but you can put a royalty on it where you get 3% of all of that art resale for perpetuity. It's a game changer for your business because now you're able to monetize in long-term any resale value and really put this into a different mindset. Yeah, I think that um, since NFTs and, and kind of to recap on what they are and you know, why would you take something and make it an NFT? Um, NFTs are proven to be unique and authentic by nature. So if you have a product that is a collectible where you're only doing a limited edition of them, where it commemorates something really special, it, even though it's very similar to sell the same item, say a anniversary card or that's perhaps wrong a, a, a poor example but say maybe it's like the um a gold medal that commemorates that you you know you were here you were a member of this club for this year it's a, it's an award there we go it's a good one it's an award all right so say that we have an award and we don't use an nft well then it's technically hard for someone to prove that that award is the original one that was given but if we give that away as an NFT, then because of the way that NFT technology works, we know that it's unique. So I think it's interesting to compare those two examples. Yeah, Ryan, have you had any cool use cases on this for unique items or any high ticket items that you guys have worked with? I mean, we've, we've used NFTs for uh, an event that we actually did. It was like a festival activation um, up in Massachusetts. So there was a like big 420 music festival with Waka Flocka, Wiz Khalifa and Grizz. And what we did was basically create an NFT that only was, it was kind of like an upgraded VIP where we had like shipping containers that were converted into lounges and we had all you can eat buffets and basically creating this experience that you could only get if you purchase this NFT. So I think that's like something really unique is being able to put together a priceless type of item and then be able to sell it when it actually has value when you put it, package it into a tangible NFT. Absolutely. Um, jump, jumping into that. So this gets a little bit more into the e-commerce side of things. Um, but it can get into events, venues, et cetera, is token gating. Now, at its core, this means that only a certain people who have access to this, uh, to this NFT, so you'd say you do a thousand NFTs as a company, 
get access into this area of your store, this area of an event, this area of your online shop. Now, some really cool things that can happen with this. You know, we're all used to these pre-Black Friday sales. But a big part of Black Friday is you don't know what exactly is going to be on sale for Black Friday. So that's where you could go and provide this NFT that gets you exclusive access to all early sales. And it could maybe be at $1,000. Now, your most loyal customers will naturally drive the price of this up over the years. And so it will give you consistent revenue through this NFT stream. But it also creates a new customer experience and a new customer loyalty to you. Um, gone are the days of the loyalty programs or the excitement where like I spent $1,000 and I get 100 points. Everyone has it. It's, it's kind of old news. And this is where you can really start to build out these unique customer experiences inside of here. Uh, really, really diving into these exper experiential uh, events. Uh, I think Ryan just made a great point about ticketing. I know we have done that for a few clubs here in Miami as well, where we've given VIP access. Uh, only if they have the holders. Um, myself and Benny, and I think Ryan as well, we were all at NFT New York, uh, which is a giant conference, over 20,000 attendees. And I, I can tell you this, is if you wanted to get into most parties, you better have had a pass to get into them. And so that pass was typically an NFT project that was hosting the party, but the same concept pairs out to anything you do as a business, any event you run, or anything on your e-commerce board. Now, I'll let these other two chime in with any cool use cases they've seen uh, as well. I think one of the most important things too is again, it goes back to that proof of ownership. So verification um, becomes, I mean, there's been so many times I've been at events where I had accidentally bought a, you know, a, a, a stolen ticket and I got it from someone else and it wasn't a real ticket. And maybe they let me in because they felt bad and they didn't know how to verify it. But with NFTs, it really makes the process a lot, you know, smoother for both the vendor and the consumer. Yeah. I think, having that um, basic concept of a space for everybody and then an exclusive space for only token holders. It's very similar to having, you know, a members only area or having something be password protected. The added benefit, you know, compared to doing that with, with a password or through building in that into your software is that you can actually allow people to own that access. So I, I just think it's an interesting comparison where, you know, in one, you're giving people passwords, you're giving them permission systems that are really controlled by the company and really controlled by your offering. But if you are token gating that experience and saying, hey, I guarantee that if you purchase this, you'll be able to access this exclusive club, you're giving people an incentive to improve that space that's within the club because they benefit from it. They have the ability to resell it later, um, as well as you're giving people added security that as long as they hold on to that NFT, um, they can confidently get into this event and get into this space. And I think we, we kind of, we're dancing around it, but this is really the the game changing of web of web three, um, which I'm going to throw that other buzzword in here just for fun. But it's the, it's this idea of what is community? What is brand loyalty? What is this interaction going to be moving forward? And this token gating experience, we'll, we'll definitely dive into this more in this conversation on memberships and, and all of this. This is the very start of how brands can start to change the way consumers interact with them. Uh, it's, you know, it's too easy now for me to go on Amazon and have an instant delivery happen within two hours of me hitting purchase that the only way I'm going to certain brands or local stores or any, or even services is really through feeling like I'm getting a unique experience that I'm a part of that company in some form that my my personal values align with them or what I like to do in my free time, et cetera. And this is really, I think the start of being able to do that. And it's so important for businesses to really pay attention here because it's this is, this is where it's going. And you know, in 2010 to 2013, we saw things like Starbucks, we saw Sephora, boom, into billion dollar businesses and it was off of their loyalty programs. They were the first ones in the space and they owned it. And so this gives a unique opportunity to really start to own it before others do and, and drive, drive that change. Perfect, jumping, jumping ahead. 
memberships. I'm going to let Ryan take lead on this one. Go ahead and uh, tell us all about it. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the main objective of, you know, any business is really to connect to their customers that support them the most. And the reason for that is because those are the ones that are going to talk about them and, and really push the needle and create that kind of, you know, the most noise. I mean, that's why social media exists. It's a tool to try to reach these people. Um, that's why loyalty programs exist. It's to, you know, give value to the people that are supporting that business the most. And I think what is really awesome about this NFT technology, it's, it's beyond a loyalty program because it's not just focused on the individual, it's focused on the community. And it really creates, you know, kind of a, I mean, we're social creatures. The whole reason you know, we're here is to connect with other people. And I think that's the unique thing that these brands are going to be able to, you know, step forward, kind of like you said, with the whole Starbucks creating their loyalty program, the new wave is going to be these kind of verifiable digital membership clubs. Um, and what that looks like is, you know, obviously different for each business. And I think any business can utilize this technology, but it specifically works great for hospitality groups. So if you're a gym or a restaurant or a club or a bar, you can really create this exclusive experience for your customers. And people outside of that club are going to see those people and be like, what's going on there? How do I get involved? Um, and I think that's what's really going to be this whole new wave of branding and, and you know, marketing, especially because unlike marketing, where a lot of these brands are spending millions of dollars to grow their business, um, and hoping that they, they see some type of value from that with these NFTs, your customers are the one that are actually purchasing, um, and supporting the business. So it almost becomes an additional revenue stream, which you could throw back in to create more creative media. Um, and you know, it kind of unlocks a whole new wave of opportunity. Yeah. And I mean, I, I like to point out on this side of it, and I, I think it's a really important one because so, so often people scoff at NFTs. But you know what the first membership-based NFT that really took off was? Board Ape Yacht Club. And, and now I know they have a lot of problems today and there's different things going on with them in terms of the back end of the space. But at its core, it's a membership. And it's a membership that became a $300 million enterprise seemingly overnight. And, and that's the thing is that just goes to show how much people want to be part of communities. People want to be part of the it involvement. It's a uh, There's a very popular nightclub here in Miami called Eleven. Right, they have their captain's club, and I I know that there's many people who feel left out when they don't have it, and they run exclusive events, things like that, and so it does allow for this exclusivity, and it also allows you to have different tiers. I think the exclusivity membership portal is it's one it's one route and one avenue, but a business needs to be really smart and strategic in this, and, and I know we advise people, and I'm sure you do as well, almost every day on you know are we going for exclusiveness, or are we going for a utility in this membership? And what, what does that look like? Because for example, if I'm a flower shop, a large flower shop in say Minneapolis, I'm not necessarily looking for the user that's gonna purchase $10,000 of flowers a year. That's probably very, very few far in between. But would I love to get where a bunch of guys for Valentine's day purchase a membership where they get flowers sent every, every month to their wife? Yeah, that's probably a great one. And so it's, I, I might be going for a bit more inclusion and I might not put a cap on the number of members I could have. Whereas a nightclub, for example, I have limited space to begin with. I want people to be fighting tooth and nail and rising that price up to get in the door. And so I think it's just a really interesting model because there's so much you can do with it in this space. Definitely. And it also kind of gives opportunities for businesses to either franchise or expand because like you said, it doesn't have to be exclusive where there's only 300 and that's it, like a nightclub. And you know now you have to buy it from the secondary market it's you can utilize it to almost open up new places. If you're a restaurant that has five locations, this technology and this membership can kind of be the thing that allows you to open up 10 or 15, allows you to scale quicker because it's coming from the community that supports you. And I think that's a, uh, and again, not to deviate too far from the conversation, but it's a really cool part of these memberships is that these NFTs can functionally become a security. And there's a whole host of financial things that you can go down. And I mean, I know my team explores people with that all the time. Uh, but at, at its core, this can be a fundraising tool. This can be something, hey, we want to build X, Y, Z for the community and you become a founding member and you get 1% royalties on it or you get 0.1% in perpetuity. And it almost can become an investment vehicle playing to the hype of this. And these founding members 
those are some of the strongest memberships, loyalty. They share all of your stuff. They want constantly to boost your business. And that's what's really crazy about the NFT space that we we haven't seen in businesses for quite some time is, man, if I'm on an NFT project, like I'm, I'm working right now with a pet, for, a pet project, and it's I'm sharing every time something new comes out. Why? Because I'm passionate about the project, but there's also a financial interest to me in the project. There's also a, I'm a person that's helping direct the strategy of the project. And so, of course, I'm going to be the most likely brand proponent and really a VIP member of that brand that is always putting it out into my audience, which, you know, my audience sits at five, 10,000 people, depending on the platform. You times that out by 100, 200 people, and all of a sudden you're getting in front of your entire target market for free. And I think that's the cool part about the membership is it really changes that marketing strategy from this paid advertising approach to organic. And it makes the customers a part of that experience, like you said, and, and it also kind of gives a whole new level of accountability for the business, which I think overall is a good thing, because if the business is saying something and they're not following through, that community could, as much as support you, go the other way. And I think it's also important because it doesn't allow businesses to kind of bully their customers. You know what I mean? There's, that's happened in, back in the day where you can be a club and don't even care about your customers because you know they're going to come, they're going to drink, they're going to spend money. But now there's a level of where you're, you kind of have to listen to your community. They're, they're a part of the decision-making process once you decide to do one of these memberships. And it's the most valuable thing because, I mean, it's the number one, one rule of business. You have to listen to your customers because they're the, they're the ones that are purchasing from you. So what better way than actually creating these platforms where they have a say and they can vote on different things and they can be a part of that process. Yeah, and I, I think that's one of the cool things and maybe Benny will chime in here a bit too is, and this is a, a evolution of the NFT is the concept of a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization. Now, certainly I wouldn't suggest many people turn their businesses over into a DAO where they have no control, but it does allow for a very cool voting mechanism of NFT holders to be able to influence some business decisions that you could define what they look like, whether it's, hey, I want to create a, a new, the spring line of clothes. Let's have our holders be able to go and vote on what print we use or what kind of dress we, we're making. And there's some really cool things. Now, Benny, I know you've worked with a few. What, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, um, I'll recap DAOs super quickly. So, um, we were talking for a moment about, I mean, we're still talking about memberships. So if memberships are created using NFTs, then the members will have NFTs. A DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And where that interplays with the membership is that if we have a group of members that each has NFTs, and then those members can vote on what they want to happen, and we have a set of rules around, hey, if 10% of all of the members cast a vote, and if it's a, and depending on what they're voting on, say they're voting on the type of flowers for an event or something like that, then we'll choose those flowers. What we, if we have that rule in place that says, hey, if a certain amount of these members make the vote and they all vote for daisies, um, if we put that on blockchain so that it automatically happens, what we've done is created a DAO. So a decentralized autonomous organization that can make decisions such as what type of flowers to get automatically on chain. So by having the NFT holders, which are the members, make a vote and then having that decision be made automatically. Sometimes it, think it sounds like with DAOs, like you might ask like, well, why would you do something like that? You know, why would you wanna have people voting, essentially voting on blockchain instead of voting, you know, via email? right? Or voting in a way that didn't use this technology. And for most situations, it doesn't make sense. For most situations, it's still easier to vote via email or vote by talking to the people that are in the organization or having perhaps a board meeting. Um, but if you are a community that really values autonomy, 
and values having a shared group of rules that no one president or no one individual could could try to steal the vote, then a DAO is a good solution. See, and I think I might I might walk a bit of a disagreeing line with you on that, as in I, I think too often in the web three space, we view DAOs as all encompassing organization runners. They handle everything. From a business perspective, though, I've seen the highest engagement through very nuanced micro engaged DAOs. What that looks like and what that means is simply put, for example, I'll go back to the nightclub. What's the drink of the night? Well, it turned out it was called a Miami Sailor and it was the most ordered drink by 4X. It also was $6 more expensive than any drink on the menu. So you can certainly drive community engagement through this because you've just created this loyalty group that feels like they're part of your brand and they're able to make decisions based on that. And, and I think that's what's more important. Like, I don't, I don't mean turn over your business by a DAO to consumers, but using this DAO for how consumers can interact with your business or what you're, what, what you're doing that you're already going to do is going to look like is a great way to create some unique items that once again, keep spreading that word of mouth. And I mean, I say it over and over again in this space, it's community, community, community. What this allows you to do is change to a brand community rather than a brand message. And I think that's the most powerful thing about Web3. It's why, why I saw myself take this proverbial leap where I had this great job in, in, in fashion into this new space that everyone thought was pictures of apes and crypto punks. Um, moving to the last one here, loyalty programs. Um, I think this, was, this is very similar to memberships. What this allows you to do though, is to purchase loyalty programs. So say, for example, a new I move and a new coffee shop's in my town. Now, they may require me to go and buy 100 drinks before I get a loyalty. Or I can go and buy an NFT from someone that had 100 drinks purchased and be able to then become part of their loyalty membership program and receive all the benefits. That's the high level what I think about it with that. Uh, Benny, Ryan, what are your thoughts with that? Yeah, I think using NFTs as a loyalty program or incorporating it into a membership, into a loyalty program is kind of another flavor to um, consider if you have an existing membership base and you're trying to get give them ways to interact. So say you have an email newsletter that's 10,000 people and you've been trying to get these people to come back to your business and they're just not replying to the emails that you're sending and clearly the coupons don't work very well. As Ryan mentioned, with people being able to trade these with each other, now they've got more of a reason to come and collect this loyalty, right? So if previously it was just a 10% coupon and they probably thought to themselves, hey, well, you know, anybody on this email list has that, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't live there anymore or I haven't been there in a little while. There's no, you know, they, they, might be, they might be bored by that email for a coupon. But if you instead say, hey, you know, you're going to come pick up five reward coins and those reward coins will give you a discount next time you come into the store well now i might think hey you know even if i don't use this coupon right now i can still benefit from this and i might turn around and i might if if i hear that ryan's going to miami i might say hey guess what i've got five coins for the local coffee shop down there that i forgot to use last time you can have them so it gives customers that would otherwise be inactive within a loyalty program, a incentive to, um, to share that with others and another reason to kind of engage. Um, I think similar to some of these things we've talked about today, it's definitely not one size fits all. And I think loyalty programs of each of the things we've talked about are probably some of the less proven out. There are a few brands that have done them using crypto. Um, but it's not super pre prevalent yet. So for people to have an existing loyalty program, I think it's something to start learning about and paying attention to. Um, because as we see other brands become successful implementing it, it might be something that's curious to try with your lists. 
Definitely. I mean, I just know for me, I lose things all the time. So like back in the day with the Starbucks, like having to, you know, punch eight holes to get something like I'm going to lose that card. And then it meant nothing to me. So the, just making it digital to me just makes a lot more sense just in terms of being able to hold it into one wallet or whatever wallet you'd like to hold it into. So I think that in one aspect can be helpful, but also I think even more importantly, again, everything about NFTs and everything about Web3 comes back to community. So normally a loyalty program is like, cool, I got that eighth punch in and I got my free coffee. Am I really going to post that on social media? Am I really going to like, hey, wow, thank you, Starbucks for doing that. That was amazing. Like, I'm not really talking about it. So like, great, I got that coffee and I'm going to probably going to keep going to that spot. But that's it's as far as it goes. It's very individual. And I think with NFTs, it creates again, a community of other people that are part of that loyalty program and you're creating communication and you're talking about it more. And I think that's, again, that's the whole point of marketing is to create that word of mouth buzz. And this is just a a stronger and smarter way to do that. Yep. And Ryan, I know you're muted. Open as you, yeah, Mr. Kirkley of the two Ryan's. (laughs) Uh, a slight a slight mini pitch here on on the loyalty programs and things like that but for for example uh we're partners with shopify here we're working with brands every day to build these loyalty programs now as we've started to build these loyalty programs out we've been able to do some really cool things like someone gets your token but they can get an extra uh, they can get extra tokens for sharing it they can get you know they can send out 10 emails and we're able to interact with that The cookie from a marketing perspective, how we used to always track any interaction or user behavior is depreciating or gone on most places. And these NFTs are are really allowed to be this kind of standalone item where we're able to reward customers for giving us more data, for sharing to their network, for giving experiential events, things like that. And so I think it's really really important to be thinking about this. Even if your brand's not quite ready today, this is the solution to what is the changing marketplace in the marketing technology world. And uh, it's definitely something where if any of you guys have questions, more than happy to have one-on-one conversations with how that relates to your brand. Um, but it's one of the coolest things that we can talk about today is really how, how does Web3 and this NFT and the smart contract replace what, what used to be what we called for third-party data and cookies. Um, getting it, Looking at time though, we're getting very close to the end here. So I want to quickly cover how to get started and then ha- open up to some questions. Um, so really, when we set, when we bring all three of us talk to projects all day long and companies, the first thing is we ask them, what is your goal? Um, what are you trying to complete? And we'll work backwards with them from there. But you can ask yourself that. And then I, I encourage you to connect with experts. And I can encourage you to connect with more than one. Um, I, I may have one idea that's that I think is the, the way to do it. You could go to Benny and he's going to have a completely other one. You go to the other Ryan and he's going to have a different one as well. And then figure out what works best for your brand and more importantly, what works best for your consumers. And that's what we do once we build the strategy is we're going to go in deep dive into what does this look like from the execution standpoint. I mean, Benny, for example, is one of my go-to dev teams anytime we're doing a very complex project because they are so good at putting the A, A, B, C, D of what this looks like, timeline, and then going back to the strategy, where's the revenue, where can we expect the payoffs, where do we look for it? The, 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 and then you get to the fun part. And this is the social content managing the community. It's completely different than any other brand membership, brand program, loyalty program, et cetera, because I've honestly worked with brands that now have 10,000, 20,000, 80,000 people sitting in a Discord community, which is just a giant Facebook group at the end of the day, talking about this program, talking about these brands, talking about everything going on. And it's the most engaging place I think I've seen in the modern world. Um, and so I think that that, that b- brings this community together and then it just becomes a long-term management of these programs, some additions, et cetera. Um, anything I missed either, to either of you guys that you typically try to imp- talk to pr- customers about when ta- they're talking with you? I think it's helpful to look for other companies that are in your industry and see what they're trying. Um, happy to talk about a few of those you know, in in the questions or talk one-on-one because there's kind of so many different examples. Um, But what a um, retail company might do that's going direct to consumer is probably going to be pretty different than what a B2B company would do. So if I, yeah, people have specific questions, we probably have time to cover a few of them today. And if not, that's something that 
um, either searching through Google, but certainly asking, asking myself, asking either of these gentlemen, um, we can help kind of point you towards some examples of what other companies are doing in your space. And that kind of gives you a sense of what might work for you. Yeah, absolutely. And with that in mind, uh, welcome you guys to either go off mute or pop in the chat. Any questions, specific things you guys thought about on this or anything that's been uh, just on your mind in the, the NFT space? Yeah, and I think we actually have two questions that were asked already. So I thought I could cover one of them that asked about for membership clubs, if you can have a voting mechanism be partial or selective where some decisions might be passed through a DAO and others not. Short answer is yes. So the recommended way to launch a DAO is to begin with keeping all of your decisions actually centralized. So keeping it with a founding team that is able to help make sure that in the early days, um, you're able to keep all of those decisions not automated and on-chain, but through a group, essentially like a board. As the DAO grows, you can transition it by adding more responsibilities to the smart contract and taking them away from the off-chain in-person group. So for example, maybe at the beginning of your DAO, you're like, you know, we all know each other. It's all right. I trust Benny to be the one that makes the decisions here. Okay, great. But then maybe the DAO grows to 10, 10 people or 15 people. And they're like, you know what? We'd really like to be able to vote on this now. Well, we can take that decision and we can say, hey, maybe some of these decisions we're going to all vote and we're going to let that decision be made on chain. And other decisions, perhaps we still trust Benny with. And there's different tools available for this. So I, I could be happy to kind of sit down and walk through some of those specific tools. Um, but long term, you can transition all of your things to on chain. So it, it is interoperable and you can do a hybrid model. Um, so let me know if that didn't answer your question and I'd be happy to talk more about it. Another question that um, came through is how can NFTs relate to B2B interactions, but you know, as opposed to the, some of the B2C use cases that we discussed? Um, Mr. Kirk, you wanna take that one? Yeah, so I, I will chime in coming from the MarTech world of uh, marketing automation and software sales for many years. Um, I think that this is one of the things that is hopefully a really good change in the B2B world. Um, yes, maybe an NFT from a business perspective may not always be purchased. I do think that there's some cool use cases though. For example, I use AWS on almost every project that we work with that requires data storage solutions. I would happily pay money to become a premier oh, partner of AWS on. through an NFT type platform here. Um, and I think that that's one of those kind of unique use cases is that you would have this ability to create these expert clubs, these unique user clubs, uh, or even just get people where they can quickly come in board. Um, for example, when I started Krypton Media, now Krypton Labs, uh, Shopify has been a partner of mine for years, but not under Krypton Media. And I, fortunately, I had some good friends. I was able to make the connection, but I would have happily paid to accelerate that partnership program and go and actually become a partner that much quicker so I get re-access to the dev tools and get myself back into developing these new projects. And so I think that that's, that's kind of one of those use cases there. The other side of this, though, is that you, the community side, whether or not you physically are going to charge for NFTs or you simply airdrop these NFTs and you can utilize them at conferences, trade shows, et cetera, for events after parties, happy hours, et cetera. It does allow for this kind of difference in the space. I know trade shows got pretty boring to me um, in, in the regular B2B space. And this is where these NFTs and these token gated experiences can really start to play a unique, Eating good unique over there. role. It's three, four, do you nine? All right. Um, yeah, I think those experiences are great examples. And we had another good one about adoption friction. And I know um, Brian Costello from Movers. So maybe to phrase this, you know, kind of give some context. Um, with new technology, a lot of the time there's, there's things in the news, there's interpretations people have about how it works that sometimes can make it hard for 
a business to then go do that offering without encountering pushback. So for example, maybe someone says, hey, I, you know, I don't understand these NFTs at all. Like, why would I purchase one? Or, hey, didn't, didn't the crypto markets just crash? Why would I purchase one? Um, and I was curious, Ryan, like how in, in projects that you've done, have you addressed and overcame kind of that friction from adopting? Definitely. I mean, it comes down to education is one of the most important pieces. Um, but also we live in a very quick, demanded customer you know, world where people want things now. And so if they don't understand something and they're, they can get frustrated and that can. Did we lose Ryan there? It looks like we may have. <laughs> it looks like we did. Um, so I'll chime in real quick because I, I think we play in similar audiences and wait for him to come back is that this this friction, I think, is, is one that, yes, it exists. It also, though, is about an early adaption. And then it's about creating processes that are easy. Um, so we work a lot with like OpenSea, which is an NFT marketplace. Uh, we work with Crypto.com. Both of these are now allowing Apple Pay. It's almost that simple. You're able to purchase these items with a credit card. And it, it may be the first interaction. Now, crypto payments, things like that, that's where you have to create some education materials. You have to create some opportunities that are a bit more robust, um, but it creates really cool content for your company and team and allows you to do some really unique things. Um, one of our favorite things to do with any project, whether it's crypto, NFT, Web2 companies, Web3 companies, et cetera, how do we communicate to our customers just what we're building and what we're doing? And so we work really closely with them to create these okay. easy to use videos, social media, and even on-site kind of training and experiential documents to explain how to do it. The QR code has revolutionized menus everywhere. It's that simple too. A QR code scanned into an app, easy to walk through the next three steps and done. That customer is now working with you. The other side of this though, is because they had to take some steps, we've actually found across our customers currently, the people who have purchase the NFTs and brands or have actually gone through and made a crypto purchase through your app are way more loyal customers. We see them returning two to three times as high. Uh, we also see higher average order values. Overall, it seems that, you know, that barrier to entry is actually creating a rather perfect idea of who your best customer is, because if they're willing to go through that, it, it means that they're, they're that much more invested into your brand. Cool. I, I kind of, disappeared on accident but i to play off of what you're saying I, I, um also i know it's about the same customers that are in the crypto space and already know how to buy these things i found that they're also super helpful in teaching others how to purchase as well and they become more than just loyal customers they almost become employees and support of your business um and i think it's a big thing too is you know web3 is constantly evolving and you know it will get simpler and, and as more and more adoption happens I think more and more people will be educated and understand this world. But I think something that's helped us, at least on more of a local level, especially businesses that just got on social media, this is completely new territory for them. It's kind of like breaking it down and disguising Web3 as Web2 at, until they're in. And then once they're in, it kind of explaining more. So like things that I've noticed is when we're approaching businesses to sell and we're saying NFT or crypto, they might get a red flag. They know nothing about this. They're like, well, crypto market's down. That's, they just heard that on the news or, oh, NFTs are a scam because that's the first thing they Google or something. So it's almost like we've been using the idea of, especially for like nightclubs and hospitality groups, just calling it, hey, have you ever had a VIP club card back in the day? That's what this is. It's a verifiable di digital membership. And when they ask, it's like, oh, are you using NFTs? I'm like, of course, that's, that's the technology. So it's almost the way that you kind of showcase the uh, information and steps really makes a, you know, a, a big help on that too. Um, a lot of things that we do is, you know, we're actually there on the ground. Um, like we're working with a club in Long Island and, you know, we are there every weekend for the first month where people can come and purchase it there in person. So sometimes people just need to learn how to do it. And eventually when you get those people on board, they're the ones telling their friends. And uh, like, it's just time will make this easier because more and more people will know how to use this stuff the same way that we've learned how to use web two um, when it first came out as well. Awesome. 
So I'm going to drop contact information in the chat, um, as well as Ryan has it up here. Also, we do have time for more questions. Um, so if people have any questions, perhaps about their specific industry, or maybe want to kind of ask us about um, something specific that you've heard of, let me know. We're here for it. I'm happy to help connect with this later as well. Um, if maybe you don't have time right now, but you'd like to sit down and see how it could work for you, I'm happy to help. And by all means, I, I see a few have already messaged me on LinkedIn, but easiest place to reach out to us is always, always LinkedIn as well for all three of us. I know we're constantly on there providing content and talking to people through their projects. So, so appreciate this conversation. Appreciate Benny and Ryan for helping put this on. Uh, I, I think it was a very, very good conversation around kind of the initial brand use cases. Absolutely. All right. Did anybody have anything else? Um, like I said, I will stay on and I'm happy to help um, talk one on one for anybody that arrived late. Um, I do think our recap, if we maybe want to want to do a recap quick, um, is that NFTs are by themselves a technology that don't mean all too much, but they do enable um, entrepreneurs, existing businesses, however you identify, um, to do memberships, to serve your community, and to sell special products that are unique and one of one. And it enables that in ways that, while very similar to existing infrastructure, are different. So we're happy to talk more about Specific businesses, somebody asked if this recording will be available. It will be made publicly available. Um, so I can make sure to follow up and provide that for you. Um, and yeah, let us know if we can help at all. I just had a quick question. You had um, touched on um, B2B businesses briefly. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious as to how this could translate to that versus the examples that were provided for B2C. Yeah. So now, do you have a B2B business in mind that we could maybe give a few examples more personal to? Um, I mean, I think that there's various industries, but I mean, in speaking about reaching the community, I think that that's interesting when you're, you're dealing with clients where they're ultimately reaching the community. So I think in, in relation to, let's say, government work in that, in that regard or um, education um, and also other spaces where you are um, in more, uh, let's say, like, I don't want to say exclusive roles, but um, I'm just curious as to how it could translate to different environments versus um, that where it is, let's say, consumer oriented and more so open to the public. Yeah, so I, I think education's kind of a great one. Um, we're working with a few companies in that space that are, are really kind of changing the game. Uh, for example, and this, this might be my favorite use case of a DAO I've seen so far is it's a company, they're working with a bunch of uh, inner city schools on web three education. And so for them, they've created this NFT drop that was used as a fundraising tool for, the, for, for them. So these schools went and made a purchase of it. Then they became members of the DAO that were voting on the curriculum. What, what people they wanna have come speak to them. What, what do they want to learn about? What's the best way to educate these kids about this? And then how do we link them to jobs coming out of high school where they maybe have an opportunity to grow faster? And so it's actually been incredibly useful to get teachers in part of this, uh, superintendents, things like that, and really start to change the game there. I also think there's some really cool applications in the government, but I think the government's going to be a little slow to do that. So from that purpose, I think I would talk about the reseller potential. Um, so people who sell into the government. Now, obviously, you're selling into multiple layers of it. But these resellers themselves are going to be great feedback tools and mechanisms for all of these things. And so you could create this NFT community where these resellers could get one-on-one -on -one access consistently to your top reps or things like that, that, you know, maybe they were smaller, but they're really committed to your product, but you don't know that yet until they go and purchase this NFT and they outline themselves as, hey, I'm going to be your number one brand advocate. And so I look for like the people that utilize resellers or third-party sellers in B2B as particularly valuable customers to this because it allows you to distinguish between your standard 
consumer and your person who is going to be your number one seller if he just gets the help and resources to do so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think another interesting example is kind of making a community out of your clients. So if you are B2B and you have um, several hundreds of clients that are using your product, they're coming out of the chat boards, they're interacting with in some way, shape or form with your brand, there is also an opportunity to kind of create a community. So um, I'm trying to think of a good way to explain this on the, a project that we're working on right now. So I guess as an example, so say that you are serving a bunch of um, financial professionals and you're serving a lot of people that they have specific needs, they have specific questions. Um, they also, it makes sense for them like to get to know each other. And, you know, maybe one accountant can do business with a CPA who can do business with somebody else that's within that suite of users that uses your product. You could consider making a community of people that use your product that comes together for events that has special perks. So for example, maybe they have more customer support calls or they have access to expert panels. So you can get you know, a, an expert in, if it was financial services, maybe you have an expert in crypto regulations that comes and speaks and only community members are able to interact with that. So I know it's kind of like a, a, a cop out because it's kind of like creating a community out of a B2B audience. Um, right. But if you're in a position where there are a lot of them, it's possible. And I guess with that sort of thing, I mean, you could utilize, let's say, traditional media strategies in order to get the word out about those opportunities, whether it be, let's say, via email, social, um, just depending on what um, strategies you have in place and um, ultimately contact information you have for your, um, let's say, clients or leads, correct, in order to ultimately build that community. Is that what you would suggest or would you suggest going about that another way? Yeah, um, both are good options. I think where my head actually starts when thinking, hey, if we've got a community is to think about the value that each of these B2B customers receives from your offering mm -hmm. and how you might be able to take some of those things and put them into a community bucket. Um, right. So an easy one is like cash discounts, right? <laughs> That's an easy one to kind of put in the bucket. But you can also think of, yeah, like if they are coming to, um, so by the way, it, it maybe, maybe it, it'd be more helpful if we could even sit down and kind of break apart those a little bit more. But I think that's kind of where my head goes is, hey, some of these things that they're offering make sense where we can, we can offer a discount and we can put a price tag on that. Whereas other things are a little bit more intangible, like having access to expert panels and access to customer support. And those things don't have as much of a price tag, but can still be packaged and geared towards the community. And something I, th I think I'd be remiss not to bring up. Uh, I think we, get, we got a little, we, we got really in the weeds there, which is great, but I think we almost missed the biggest benefit to this entire, like to the crypto world, to B2B. Taking money in crypto means your payments come instantly. It means you could then theoretically pay your employees instantly. So for a small business, and I, I say this as a small business that scaled very quickly in employees, the USD payers, I'm sitting here waiting for Chase Bank to release my funds and bill.com to process it through for 72 hours. And then I had my Web3 companies that paid me in crypto. And the, you know, I was able to instantly put that into my employees' accounts, into payroll, into anything I needed, et cetera. And so there is actually a benefit, especially as we're starting to talk with these really high dollar volume transactions where a software service could be a $1.2 million purchase to not have to go through this seven to 10 day waiting period for access to funds, particularly during scaling and ma major periods of time and, and instantly get that and be able to turn it into cash into bank accounts, distribute it to employees, team members, et cetera. And so I do think there's a really cool opportunity on the B2B side for, for crypto adoption on that end. Thank you. Any other questions?
Seeing none, I think we'll wrap up here. Um, thank you all so much for attending and hope you have a great rest of your week. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. I'll stay on the line for anybody that was perhaps arrived late or has any other final questions they wanted to ask one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we'll be back in the future to do more of these. So, all right, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome, Donald, I know, and actually here one moment, I will actually end the recording um, and we'll probably end up kind of cleaning up some of the endings at the end too, all right.